Hi, it's so nice to see everyone again virtually. You're on Music and Chat with Shelly Ong and it's a good evening from me to you. And yes, I am in Nashville, Tennessee, at least the one in the USA. Uh, please say hi in the live chat. I've indicated where it is. And let us know where you're tuning in from, please. And don't be backward and coming forward. I want to say hi to my dear friend, Tony Fowler. He made it back to Melbourne. So I'm glad he's here. Also, my other good friend, Jim Sosnan. Hey, Jim. Still having breakfast? Yes, we all do need our breakfast and our coffee. That's for sure. I'm glad you made it. Hooray. And uh, another friend from this time, Sydney, Australia, my dear friend, Sam. Sam, uh, I guess you've had your breakfast. <laughs> Anyone else, please say hi in the chat. Don't be back when coming forward. And uh, remember to put any questions you may have also in the live chat so that I may attend to them as the stream moves along. And the stream will move along about 30 seconds at least slower, <laughs> at least from where I'm doing it in real time to when you receive this, the feed. Um, I also want to thank those who have bought my CD and poster set. With three weeks to go to Christmas, you have plenty of time. Uh, and this is for US residents. Uh, you can scan this code again for US residents. Um, or click the link that's in the text below the video. If you are in, and this is what I've discovered, my uh, friends from Germany who want to buy the set, uh, shipping and handling is $16. Uh, for uh, Australia, uh, shipping and handling is $19. International postage is a killer, I must say. But if you're in Australia and you're interested in the set, um, and uh, uh, let me know and when I'm back in Singapore, it'll probably be cheaper to mail it from there and I'll take the sets back to me and do that. Um, anyway, message me and I'll send uh, you uh, directions as to what to do and so on and so forth. Um, we have someone else who's joined us and they're hiding behind the moniker modulator esp hi whoever you are and wherever you're tuning in from welcome to our warm couch we are with good friends here so i suspect you must be a good friend then modulator esp okay it's uh 4 35 p.m central time where i am it's probably 6 35 a.m. in Singapore the following morning. Therefore, it uh, is 9.35 a.m. in Australia, Eastern Australia, where all of you are, at least my friends. So let's get on with the stream. Uh, don't be afraid to cross chat. Oh, modulator ESP is Jess. Hey, Jess. So glad you made it. Jess is, of course, as he says, from the UK. Our first UK couch warmer in this group of old friends. Wonderful. The couch is long and wide, so there's space for everybody. Okay, so without further ado, I'm going to play you something. Uh, it's a piece uh, from this extended <laughs> concerto, at least that's what I've been calling it, that I've been putting movements to uh, one at a time. And uh, uh, this one is one of my latest movements. So a piece at a time means a movement at a time, at least that's what I'm calling them. And I've named it Galor, which is Spanish for heat, uh, the, the, the temperature heat, not spicy, which I know a lot of people like to use the word caliente, which is kind of like spicy, but calor is heat. At least it's, this is what I understand. And I named it that because I, I had finished it in um, Fort Wayne, Indiana, where I was visiting Sweetwater and my friend Mark Hoffman. And uh, it was a, quite a humid day uh, when I decided to record a music video for it. So I thought, I'm going to call it calor. <laughs> 
It was a piece for theremin. So I'm going to play it for you. But uh, before I do, I'm going to thank Tony Fella, who said he had, he had informed quite a few people about today's stream. So hopefully there will be a crowd. Yes, I hope so too. I think Jim sosnan has been at that as well, uh, knocking on people's virtual doors. <laughs> so thanks, Tony, and thanks, Jim. And thanks, Jess, as well. I think Jess probably has spread the word some. So let me just turn on my theremin cam. Um, it's quite. It's been quite cold in Nashville uh, this week. It snowed, so I'm a little chilly. So I'll just warm my fingers up. <laughs> so this is. So this is calor.
So that was Galor. Um, I hope you enjoyed that. That was a little tricky there. I was trying to turn on a couple of plugins on my uh, keyboard controller. And again, the tech, uh, technical hit gremlin hit the, hit the, <laughs> this particular time and I didn't get it done, but, um, I hope you enjoyed it anyway. So who else is out there? I want to know. Uh, I do see a lot of virtual bodies, uh, according to the count that I see here on my screen, but, uh, the rest of you are too shy <laughs> to come forward and say hi. Hmm. Anyway, so our guest today is Peter Zinov Zinoviev. I think I'm saying it properly. Uh, he it was a one third of the EMS Limited in London. Uh, the company is no more in existence, so uh, I guess he would be the ex co-founder. Uh, but in our eyes, he's still the co-founder, uh, and the company is very much still alive in our memories. <laughs> So if you are keen to uh, quiz Peter, you are at the right place and at the right time. And Peter needs no further introduction. So let's bring him on. I know he's waiting there on Skype. So let's call him. Please leave a message after beep. <laughs> I'm going to try again. <laughs> I'll try a third time. I have a feeling he's watching the live stream and he thinks I'm still playing. So one second. The person who you're trying to reach is currently unavailable. Huh. Please, please, please. Hold on. Let me send him a message. Uh, yes, Jess, I'm sorry. I guess I should have said, uh, I, I, I implied that the uh, old gods from the original trio, I suppose, of EMS uh, is, you know, they are not part of the establishment anymore. And Robin Wood uh, has taken over the reins after several iterations of the company. So, yes, thanks for the reminder. Um it's always good to have friends around because they, they keep you on the straight and narrow. So I'm going to try calling Peter again. I spoke to him 15 minutes before we went on air. So uh, he is there, I know. The person who you're trying to reach is currently unavailable. Leave a message after the beep. Hmm, I am not successful. Uh, I'll try again in a minute, uh, but let me leave him a message. Oh, I think he is. Hold on. All right, let me try again. Uh, 
Okay, he is typing. I want to say hi to um, Gary Yelton. I believe you're hiding under behind a uh, night guys media, aren't you, Gary? I think he says technical difficulties are preventing the continuation of tonight. <laughs> oh, you're funny. Yeah, I tell you what. Uh, I saw, I saw Peter typing where you know you've got the little animated blips and blobs which show you that some there's oh. He's calling us. One second. Peter. You work on Skype on several machines. Oh. So while I was looking at your other, you were sending me messages. <laughs> right. No worries. Uh, could you turn your video on, please? Thank you. There we are. Perfect. Let me just send to you quickly so we can all see your smiley face. Um... All right, here I am smiling. <laughs> <laughs> yes, perfect. Okay. But you've gone all blurred, but you've come back now. Yeah, I wonder what's happening. You know, I wonder if it's just that the uh, holiday season me has meant that more people are on the internet highway and it's it's fairly crowded there. <laughs> I wonder if that's a reason. Because <laughs> I've got um, my ethernet connection, so I should be, be pretty, you know, I, I should be driving in the uh, HOV lane, I think that's what you call them. <laughs> Whereas it's, it's freer of traffic, but... Um, so Peter, so glad that you finally made it. I was starting to worry a bit. Uh, I hoped you hadn't gotten uh, distracted by something else, but I'm glad you are here with us. No, the thing is that you suggested I had another iPad on. Uh -huh. So the two iPads were trying to compete over Skype. Yeah. I, 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 ha I should have thought of that, but uh, I'm glad you got it sorted out. Well done. <laughs> uh, bef anyway, bef we so we have quite a few people uh, here today who are fans of yours, uh, a huge bunch from Australia and um, a small bunch from the US and uh, another bunch from the UK. So we've got a nice... Well, hello everyone. <laughs> <laughs> there you go, Peter said hello. Um, so... Um, uh, I, I want to try and move things this stream along a little uh, quicker than I usually because I know it's late for you and uh, I, I'm assuming that uh, those who are here have a bunch of questions for you so I don't want to take up too much time but I'll begin with a question of mine and, and it's about the time that you toured the BBC Radiophonic Workshop. Um, so the question is, uh, using tape sounds to create compositions is an arduous activity. Did you witness anything at the workshop to make you wonder about alternatives or creative ways for similar results? Well, I, I've only visited the workshop. I never worked there or anything, but they did buy our equipment. Ah. And, um, Two of, two of the people working there, Delia Derbyshire and Brad Hodgson, came to work with me and we formed a company called Unit Delta Plus. That's the answer to that question. Okay, so, but you were given a tour of the workshop, weren't you? Or, or did I get this wrong? I visited it several times, yes. Oh, did you see anything that piqued your fancy, you know, because I know you have a very creative mind. Your mind is always on the go for thinking of something new and adventurous to do. Did anything that you, that, that you saw at the tour kind of gave you suggestions as to what you might like to have? No, the other way around. Oh. I mean, they wanted things which I had to give them, ah. which is, I think, the way around. Okay. Thank <laughs> you. So, um, 
As you were saying, you convinced uh, Delia and Brian to join you in forming Unit Delta Plus, which, uh, as far as I understand, is an, was an organization to create and promote electronic music. And as far as I understand as well, it was a place for musicians to experiment um, and at no charge. Is that correct? Not really, no. Oh. It was set up purely to make commercial music. Oh. And we didn't make very much. We made one advert. But we did a few, a few little things, and then, and then we disbanded, really, okay. because I think because my studio was rather, it was very cumbersome. I had, I had, it was computer controlled, and mm. only I really knew how to control it. I see. And because the programming was very, very slow, it wasn't like the slickness which they could get in the radiophonic workshop, working very fast with cutting tape and 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 sine wave oscillators and music concrete things and um whereas mm -hmm. my studio was was the beginning of like of computer music really and and very complicated i see but while you guys were together if i may call you guys and gal <laughs> <laughs> You did do a, a, a handful of performances, and I actually found a flyer and a newspaper ad for the 1969 Million Volt Light and Sound Rave at London's Chalk Farm Roundhouse, which yes. uh, the Beatles, or at least Paul McCartney, uh, headlined, and uh, 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 Unit Delta Plus uh, also provided something for that performance so let me yeah just... that's never been released ah um in fact um yeah it, it would be lovely if, if we could get it out and go over it i'd love to go over that mm. and see what it was so here i have uh, the newspaper ad uh it's the melody maker magazine actually <laughs> it was an ad in that magazine which is interesting and here's the poster <laughs> and here's the poster it's a little hard to tell to figure out what it's saying the poster but i did someone ma somewhat make out a uh, unit delta plus in the right top right quadrant of the poster at the very bottom most part of the top right quadrant if you squint hard enough you'll see unit delta plus mentioned on really? the poster yeah you just got to squint hard enough, which I did. I'd love, I'd love you to send me a copy of that. Sure. Yes, I can do that. I'll send you both. <laughs> so, do you, you do you recall much of that performance? Do you recall how it well it was received? Uh, did you have? I uh... don't think it was really received. It was a rave, you know, and it wasn't really a performance. It was a sort of. Um, I've got the poster next door here, and um, oh. yeah, it was a long time ago. So it was more like a dance party, or at least a movement, dance and movement party. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's what we understand rave to be. So that was that must have been an interesting performance, so to speak. Was it primarily tape, kind of a music concrete stuff? kind of thing yes well and and paul mccartney playing and i think it was the first use of a word rave really i think so huh so um that's interesting yeah <laughs> so uh, everybody i hope you've got your questions handy uh, i know a few of you want to say hello to peter if you do please put it in the live chat there we go. And I also want to say hello to someone else who has joined us. Uh, I am not sure of your proper name, but your moniker is Jana Visong. Please uh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, but you are from Colorado. I have never been to Colorado. <laughs> have you, Peter? I haven't. I... Well, I did at one point. Um, our American agent for VCS3s took me on a tour to try and try and convince um, bands in America that what they wanted was not country western but 
oh. to play the synthesizer. And oh. it was a complete flop of a tour, so obviously. So how was it a flop? They didn't manage to convince well, people. Well, because nobody, none, none of the groups wanted to be involved in anything electronic like that. I mean, even guitar effects were, were very rare. Huh. Uh, do you think that they had a fear for electronics? Or they didn't think well, there was a relevance for electronics? They were, they were completely irrelevant. So, so this agent and me would sort of barge in on some pop concert and say, well, what you really need is this. this. And I've got, I've got a modern version of it here called the Simtrax. Can you see it? Uh, yes, hold on. Let me get you f sent it. Yes. Whoa. And th this is a Latvian version. And oh, I was wow. giving it the other day, and it's very clever and works very well. Um, and there are also, of course, um, several um, emulators, computer emulations of the VCS3. So, but anyway, it's no use just taking something like that to a pop group which is successful. Mm. I guess they want to stick to their own recipe, their original recipe. Mm. I guess sometimes it's hard to, to create change when uh, the person or the group involved is very much stuck on being true to their original selves, whatever that may mm. be. <laughs> I like your performance on, on the theremin. Oh, thank you. And, and I thought I'd, I've, I've got a nice photograph of me with the creator at a Bourges festival. Oh, with Leon? Yes. Very so, nice. So I'll send it to you. Yes, yes, please. That would be very nice. So I want to move on to uh, the, your time with EMS then, because it looks like we have questions about it. So let's see. From what I understand, EMS came together in 1968 and was formalized in 69 thereabouts. Um, do you recall what the goals of the three of you were? Were there any particular goals that you met or did not meet? Yeah, the goals were very simple. It was to finance my studio. Ah. So if you, if you can imagine that the first computer which we got had 4K of memory mm -hmm. and cost the equivalent of perhaps $150,000. Mm. So that was out of a out of a league of all the sort of ex army stuff which I had oscillators and things. Mm -hmm. So in order to f to finance the studio um, and get more computers and more hardware, I formed this company EMS purely to, purely to regurgitate the money. I see. So um, I have a question from uh, my good friend, uh, Gary Yelton, who uh, was former um, senior editor of Electronic Musician magazine. He has retired, but his question is, were there any prototypes for the VCS-3? Was there a VCS-1 or VCS-2? Well, there were lots of discussions with Don Banks in Melbourne. Ah. And... Um, that's really how it arose. It was a mixture of, um, all right, we'll make a portable um, electronic music studios. What are, the, what are the actual items which I would have loved to have found in a junk shop? And so it came up with a few oscillators and a filter and a reverberation unit would be lovely. Mm. And then I had in my studio it developed um, I originally wired the studio with thousands of kilometers of wires. Right. And then I decided it's impossible to plug all these things together with leads. Mm -hmm. So again, in the next army shop, I found a, a, a pin panel with 256 or 64 by 64 pins. Oh. And that's what gave rise to a, to a matrix board on the VCS3. I see. So it had really all all the items which I would have loved to have started off with, instead of mm -hmm. the over over heavy, very many wired studio which I had developed. So it was it was like a dream come true, really. So did you call this uh, 
prototype or a VCS3 immediately or was there a version one or two? I think they're probably voltage controlled synthesizer, we can't just call it. It has to have an, a different number. So mm -hmm. no, I think three sounds better than one. And Slips off the tongue better. VCS3. Yeah, that's true, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I've never thought about it. <laughs> So I've got some pictures uh, I want to show uh, everyone. Uh, one is of the uh, the shed which uh, started uh, which was started off uh, when Unit Delta Plus was uh, still together, and this was the the beginning of e EMS uh, as well before you transferred or transpose the studio to your house. Is that correct? Which I have a picture yes, of as it well. it is. It is. That's what I meant. In that, in that, um, that was, you know, a massive amount of wires and I can't really see it, um, but. Yeah, so um, Jess, uh, good friend Jess Creek, who is in the UK, uh, has something to say about the matrix. It says the matrix is one of my favorite features of the VCS. I think so. I think it's mine as well. Uh, maybe it's just that I think it's, uh, it's a clever way to connect, to make connections and it's different from patch, patch cords and things like that. I think I, I just like to be different. <laughs> um, well, it's not just that. It clears it clears the synthesizer. So instead of having hundreds of leads hiding the knobs, and you you can't be so tactile when you've got leads in the way. Mm -hmm. A good friend of mine in Singapore calls uh, having plenty of leads, and uh, they, some people call them cables, refer to them as cables, mm. as spaghetti. Let's clean up that spaghetti, shall we, he would say. <laughs> Well, I seem to have hundreds of leads now, but they're all really just connecting, connecting external devices, like hundreds of USB leads. And so it still goes on. Mm -hmm. So uh, I have a question from Jez again, but I think we know the answer to this. And he said, uh, why did you call the original VS3 the Putney? And I think it's because, you, you know, you, you recited in Putney, and therefore it was a convenient name to use. Is that true? I think it's, I think that probably the first sales, people wanted to call it something, uh -huh. just in the same way as the Synthi 100, which we built. When the, when the Radiophonic Workshop got theirs, they ordered the first one. They yeah. called it the Delaware, because the Radiophonic Workshop was in Delaware Road. Uh -huh. There you go, Jess, that's your answer. <laughs> um, and uh, so I understand that R&D was done at the Cricklewood studio uh, overseen by David Cockrell. And you had demo demonstrations and sales and composition at the studio in your home in Putney. Did you, of all the designs that came out of EMS, do you have a favorite? Um. Well, it's difficult to say really because I, d I never liked synthesizers very much and I'm, I sort of worked with, with my very complicated studio, which was in a way a gigantic synthesizer, but mm. a lot of it was spent programming with just a teletype and this very mm. simple computer. Mm -hmm. And then David Cockrell made a, a large number of peripherals, voltage controlled peripherals, which I could control from the computer. But every time that I wanted to change a frequency, say, or change an amplitude of an amplifier, it meant it meant paper tape going through the computer and mm -hmm. these numbers being passed on to digital to analog converter, which passed it on to the amplifier. So it was very cumbersome. Mm. It's not at all like um, working with a computer nowadays. It's, I mean, the computer behind me 
where I have po probably 50 terabytes of data compared to 8K of data. It's sort of unbelievable. Um, and I had four megabytes of memory mm -hmm. as opposed to 64 or whatever it is, gigabytes, you know, it's a gigantic difference. Yeah, the scenario is very, very different now, isn't it? And uh, it wasn't that long ago, too, when you think about it. So I have a couple of questions. Um, Jess, again, wanted to know, why is the Mach 2 VCS3 called a synthy? That always seemed odd to me. Why is it called a synthy? Um... I don't know. I can't remember when when the word synthy came in, mm. but um, uh, I think it became a generic word for all our products: for synthy VCS three, oh. for synthy one hundred, for synthy. I think that's what it was. Hmm. There you go. That's an interesting hmm. question. Um, so, a uh, Gary. Wanted to know uh, initially how you used your computer, but you explained that already. So part two of his question is, did any music result from that process that you explained? Yes, lots of music resulted. And, um, and the best music, I think, was in collaboration with other, with other composers, especially Harrison Birtwistle, which I did a lot of work with in the studio and Hans Werner Henser, and they would come with uh, musical ideas, which I was able to um, fulfill for them without them having to get their hands messy on any equipment. So it was, it was a, a strange way of working, hmm. but um, it worked very well. So there were some wonderful pieces. Um, Henser's Tristan, which is for piano, orchestra and electronics, has had lots of performances mm -hmm. and um, Chronometer, which um, by Bert Whistle, which in the end I was able to more or less um, completely do autonomously from the computer, controlled tape machines starting and stopping with solenoids, as well as controlling the equipment. <coughs> so uh, Gary wanted to know if they can be heard now I believe they're recordings of uh, at least a couple of the pieces you mentioned Peter uh, I did see chronometer somewhere uh, at least that's the bird whistle one of the bird whistle pieces and that this you mentioned. one is certainly out by Deutsche Grammophon it's um, so it, and it's quite often performed. There you go. So here's an interesting question. Uh, it's interesting to me because uh, we want to know if you remember any of your staff from EMS well. Well, I certainly remember Robin Wood and see him several times a year. So um, and unfortunately, he, he was too shy to come on this program. I know. I tried to... Uh, uh, cajole or corral him <laughs> depending on how you want to see it uh, but yeah he seems to rather leave you to be in the spotlight than uh, than he he's not really into being shown on screen so much um, but we also have a, a good friend of ours who is in the viewing audience right now who worked with you around the same time that Robin did uh, his name is Tony Fowler do you remember him Oh, yes. Gosh. Hello. <laughs> Tony. So there you go. So Tony uh, handed me a copy of the resignation, a letter that he sent you guys when he decided that he was of no use to you anymore. <laughs> and I got it here, strangely enough, um, if you're curious. So yeah, here is the... It? You've gone very blurred. Oh, I'll stand very still. So no, the, le the letter kind of says, uh, 
Many thanks for your letter and we're indeed sorry to learn that you cannot continue your employment with us. Uh, we understand so and so forth, but um, yeah, I won't read it all, uh, all for you because uh, you can see a re replay of the video later on if you like, unless you want me to read it for you or I could s email it to you. No. <laughs> so anyway, um, Tony says hello as well. Uh, he says here, uh, hold on one second. Uh, he say his, he says, uh, hello, Peter, last saw you in September of 73. Oh, was I born then? <laughs> Thanks, Peter. We needed an injection of humor at that point. Yes, was he born then? I suspect the answer is yes. Unless someone else was masquerading as you prior to your birth. <laughs> um, so, uh, and Tony continues to say, I, I had a great three months with you all. He didn't stay very long. But I, I know he has fond memories. So um, I've got, I see several questions popping up. Um, and I'll address that one later. But uh, I did want to look at some of the artists who came to discover and use uh, the various synthesizers that EMS designed. Uh, do you have any recollection of any one of them, especially that they got interesting sounds or made interesting uses of the synthesizers? Um, what sort of people? Uh, I say here artists who bought and got to use your synthesizers, those kinds of people. I say artists, uh, but uh, I, you know, we could also include ordinary people like a lot of us who just wanted to uh, play with the synthesizers and actually had the money to to buy buy them and use them. Well, I don't think I want to talk about pop groups. I mean, I'd rather rather because. For one thing, I had very little to do with them. Um, mm. As I said, I didn't really deal with synthesizers at all, really. And Robin Wood was the one who did the demonstrations. And it was always rather mysterious that that any of these devices got taken up um, by pop groups. But um, uh, that's an interesting. I suppose the Who is 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 the one which um, I, I, Pete Townsend would be the one I'd, I'd think of first. I do have a picture uh, of Pete Townsend with his VCS3. Uh, and I know he did put it to very good use uh, in The Who. I believe uh, a very popular piece of this is... Uh, the Baba O'Reilly introduction to was it teenage, not teenage dreams. What what was it? Someone tell me. Someone in the audience can tell me. But uh, Tony, uh, our mutual friend, uh, was telling me that because uh, uh, he was a uh, guest in season one of my live stream as well. And uh, he was telling me that, and I've got this here, that you actually sent him to Montreal for the weekend to fix up Jethro Tull's keyboard. Well, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, it doesn't surprise me. Why would that be surprising? I don't... Um, I mean... It's just like Robin, who who deals with lots of pop groups now, and he, they sent their equipment to be repaired. So, I once went to repair a Synthi 100 in Greece, and um, I'm no good at electronics, really, except on a very primitive way. And all I had to do was to fiddle around with a power plug, and it worked. 
So I was very pleased. Also, also once with with Vicente 100 in Moscow, uh -huh. where the the person who was looking after it had a bed next to it because he loved it so much. <laughs> so. So was the Cynthia 100 in his bedroom or was his bed no, in the... It, no, in Melodia Studios. Oh. Yeah. Oh, did he love his Cynthia 100 so much he couldn't part with it day and night? Yes. Oh, wow. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> That's... And, um, I mean, even, you know, we had, we had Moog playing on the floor with the VCS3, but which was quite interesting. He liked it too. So Jess confirmed uh, that yes, uh, Pete Townsend used the VS, uh, VCS3 on uh, Teenage West, Wasteland. Or Baba O'Reilly. Anyway, there you go. Mm. It was something like that anyway. Thanks, uh, Jess. So uh, I do know that um, speaking of the Synthi 100, that uh, we had a uh, Stockhausen, a picture of Stockhausen with his Synthi 100. That's did, right. Cologne Studio was one of the first ones to get one. Did you ever meet Stockhausen? Yeah, he came, he came to Putney and um, to try it out to begin with, but he didn't really have a clue about it. But he bought um, one anyway? Well, the studio did. West oh. German Radio, yes. Do you know if he used it much? Yes, I think they did. I think they probably still do. Um, I passed it last year at the studio in Cologne. I was giving a concert there. Um, huh. Do you know or do you have a recollection of where the other Synthi 100s have gone to? And we, we know that uh, BBC uh, Radiophonic Workstation bought one, and as you mentioned, and um, Stockhausen Studio bought one. Uh, as far as I am, I know there were at least 30 made. There were about 30 made. Well, Belgrade has got one, and... Mm -hmm. um, Belgrade Radio, which has been restored, uh -huh. and the Athens one has been restored. Ah. And I don't know about the Moscow one. I think that's still in use. Um, Bucharest, there's one in Canada. There's somebody in England who's bought one, who's got it in his private house. Wow. So we know about we know about a few of them. Yes. Well, by uh, chance. Uh... I discovered that there is one in the University of Melbourne, and I've got yes. a picture of it that was restored by its uh, technical expert, Leslie Craythorn. So I have a picture of them yes. together. Uh, in fact, uh, Tony tells me that uh, Leslie performed on this Synthi 100 a few years ago. Yes, well, I. Why? Why not? I mean, they don't wear out. I mean, there's not. They're not elastic bands, and. <laughs> <laughs> they don't wear out, and they don't have to be updated every five years, like a like a laptop or a computer. No, on the contrary, modifications, I think, take away from it. And um, mm. there are now very few VCS3s left which are unmodified. Oh, uh, Jess in UK tells me that Tom Carpenter of Analog Solutions had one and uh, he's building a version of it called the Colossus. He is? What you mean from scratch or modifying the Synthi 100? You tell me. So this is Jess. We'll wait for him to comment. But we have a question from Gary uh, in the U.S., Asheville, North Carolina. Do you remember a synth called the Ionic Performer? It's my understanding that it contained EMS circuit boards. 
Did you license your technology to other synth manufacturers? No, we haven't. Never did. Mm. So, I, I, I can't I can't remember about Ionix. It's a pity Robin isn't here. He would know. I guess I could always pop this question in an email to Robin. Um, not well, now. <laughs> not now. Uh, on another occasion, and I could inform the viewers. Oh, so Jess tells me that uh, Tom Carpenter of Analog Solutions is building a new version, a new version of Synthi 100. Wow. Called Colossus. That would be interesting. What's more, I wonder? Yeah, me too. Why would you want to build a new version? <laughs> That's most interesting. They, they were too big for Synthi 100. They were too big. And especially nowadays, when when I can't think how you, I can see why people might want the AKS or the VCS3 because you can it's portable, but a Sydney 100 is certainly not portable, and mm. and um, there you are stuck in an old 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 design when you can do such marvelous marvelous inventive things with with modern computers i totally agree with you and i've been saying 1000 i don't know why but it's synthy 100 i think in my mind i'm thinking of something else but excuse me my apologies so uh yes i anyway <laughs> good luck Good luck to uh, Tom Carpenter of Analog Solutions. I'm guessing he's in the UK, Jess. So, uh, on to more interesting stuff. Um, <laughs> Peter, how are you feeling? Is it a cold day? It's very cold. It's very cold. And I don't know why you keep flickering. Oh. But it must be perhaps my power supply is running out. Hope not. Hope not too. Um, um, anyway. Don't don't. So. Yeah, I know it can be quite distracting when the video or the audio is not smooth. I know that. Uh, apologies, but I see you quite clearly. Uh, your audio and video are smooth. And I see it being sp uh, sped out to YouTube. Everything looks perfect. So it could be your connection somehow. I'm not sure. So uh, Gary tells us that, uh, and I don't know what this stands for. Gary, you'll have to tell me. But the E-M-E-A-P-P -P has a <laughs> Cynthia 100 in Pennsylvania. E-M-E-A-P-P. -P -P. Um, Gary, we'll wait for your reply. So, Peter, I thought I should approach your a uh, composition work. Uh, I know you've done several collaborative uh, projects in the last few years, but am, am I wrong to suggest that you stopped composing for a while and you picked it up just? Recently, yeah, I, I started composing again with a, with a marvelous commission from TBA Twenty One in Vienna in two thousand and ten, and since then I've been at it all day and all night. So, oh, I see. So th that particular project you're talking about—that's the morning line, or this is a yes, that oh, was right. a first thing. Okay, and then they gave me an, they gave me another co um, commission to write. So I wrote Good Morning Ludwig, where I had a oh. wonderful conversation with Beethoven about his Coriolanus overture and um, what he would permit me to to change in the scoring. Ooh. So I rescored it with permissions for him. And it was a three-dimensional work. Ah. It was very interesting. So we did it at, at uh, in in Cologne and and... It only was for one performance, but it required 50 or so suspended speakers in different orientations. So it was in B format, so that, so that um, it required a lot of computers to put it on. 
It's very interesting. So I could suspend cellos high up in the roof and have have the clarinets right down below the ground. Wow. So it was very interesting. Suspending the speakers, um, of course, I hope it's not the real people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway. Um, is is my video still flickering badly? Yeah, it is. Yeah, yes. I thought so. Cause I can see in your your face that you are not seeing a fluid video, and it's quite distracting. I'm um, sorry about that. Nothing I can do. Um, but we shall persevere some. I do have a clip uh, of that particular project that you talked about, the uh, interdisciplinary collaborative project that involved artists, architects, engineers, and musicians, mm -hmm. which was conceived by artist Matthew Ritchie and commissioned by the Thyssen Bornemitzer Art Contemporary in Vienna. That's what TBA 21 is. Perfect. Thank you. And I see here they had an interactive multispatial sound system from the Music Research Center of York University in the UK. That's right. That comprised, oh boy, 47 channels, 41 speakers, 12 woofer, subwoofers, six video projections, and 30 composers. And you were one of the 30 to receive this yeah, commission. It was amazing. You know what? Yeah. It's amazing. I put together a short 40 second clip uh, with some of the photos and video, which I believe is of your piece. So I'm going to play it. So right. one, one second, please. Oh, that's not the one. This is the one. So do you see the video on your other iPad? No, because that doesn't work now because oh. it interferes with the Skype. Oh, okay. Good idea. Leave it alone, I say. So I think I picked the right video because it. Uh, what I found online was attributed to you. So I hear a lot of bell-like sounds. Uh, yeah, this probably is. It was a long piece. It was 40 minutes long. 40 so. minutes. Do you recall where you found your sound objects? Did you play well, them? Well, it was called, it was called, um, uh, well, I called it Bridges, really, because it was projecting to the past. From, so the first thing was, was um, a bit of Beethoven's Eroica, and then there was Bartok remembering, uh, recording, Turkish tunes, and oh. then there was, uh, I used a bit of vocoder voice, which I recorded here, and and to um, contrast that, I also used synthesized voice in Vocaloid, so um, I was able to compose a whole, a whole tune, which sounded as if it was being sung, but was actually synthesized. Oh, and um, and then a lot of the time was spent um, deciding how to project this sound by working at the York University with the people there, especially Tony Maud, who's mm -hmm. now a professor of sound at Guildford, sorry, University. So um, I assume that you used your computer for all this. You didn't go back to the old tape and splicing. <laughs> 
Did you use your favorite contact sampler plugin and the Adobe Audition door? I think you mentioned. I, 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 I still stick to Adobe Audition and Reaper are my two favorite. Reaper. Audition is fantastic for, for just editing a single or one or two tracks. It's very clean and easy and fast. And then Reaper is, is also wonderful and inventive and you can do what you like with it, really. So those two programs plus Contact are my favorite, what I use most, I suppose. What kind of processes or manipulations do you tend to favor when you get into the mind space of creating a composition? It's sort of impossible to tell because I suppose I have um, 2,000 plugins. So for each piece which I do, I sort of, I spend days deciding which ones I'm going to use and then limit it to perhaps 20 different ones. Um, I'm, so, I'm, yeah, so all the usual ones. All the usual ones. What are the usual ones? Like fab filters. Yeah. I mean, it, it's a bit far away, but, um, I show you here. These, these are my plugins. So, um, what about um, Arturia? Familiar to you? Yes. Boz. Dear Reality. Bucket Music. I don't know, all of them really. Just going to Voxengo. Um, trying to see how many there actually are. Um, 22,000 different plugins, I think, in, uh, accumulating gradually. A lot of them are very old now. A lot of prototypes. But, um, Do you find yourself reaching for similar processes in the digital world, you know, th that you're familiar with in the analog world? Do you begin with any of these or do you experiment first? Well, the last piece I did, which is um, with Lucy Railton, ah. and it came out just a month or two ago yes. on vinyl called RFG. What happened then was um, I got Lucy to improvise with her cello um, fragments. I'd give her something to improvise on, whatever it is. It wouldn't matter. A piece of stone from the garden, oh. a memoir, an upside down bucket. Doesn't matter what, just something for her to play with. And then, and then I'd build up from her playing a catalogue of sounds, probably several, not all that number, say a couple of hundred sounds. And this would be in a way my library. And then each would would have would have thousands of children and then gradually. Mm -hmm. So in the end the very the very um, complex electronic sounds are all derived from from real life cello sounds. And then Lucy plays on top of that as a virtuoso cellist. So, when so it's... somehow it keeps an integrity of mm. the sound because however distant recorded sounds manipulated, there still is a, a sort of flavour of cello left. So when you say that uh, you gave her a stone or a bucket or whatever object it is for her to play, did she play it with a bow or did she play it uh, intuitively? Yes. Well, I wanted her to play, um, I wanted the samples to begin with to be sort of comfortable. So it would, 
we tried lots of different scratching things. First of all, she's got a very nice cello. Mm. And um, so we didn't want to destroy that. No. <laughs> and, and, and so she, her special, what she does is she's a virtuosa performance of modern contemporary music. Mm -hmm. So she's used to doing extreme manipulations of the mm -hmm. cello. I understand. And that's what it was. And it, it was a, it it took about a year, I suppose, to do. And it was very very good collaboration. She'd come here and stay, and and do some recording, and we'd listen together to what I'd done, and and then I she lives in Berlin, and then I'd send her send her bits and. And then we gave, must have been perhaps 30 concerts in Europe the year before last. Wow. And, um, and played it. So it was, so it's quite polished now, I think. Mm. I do have a 40 second clip again, which I put together from photos I found online and a bit of the recording you sent me. So I'll play that now. Done. Thank you. So, how did the project first come about? Did you, she seek you out, or did you discover her? No, I'd been I'd written with Aisha Orozbayeva. I'd written two violin concertos. Okay. And we performed one. Uh, must have been four or five years, four years ago, at, at the London Contemporary Music Festival. And that was organised by Lucy Railton. And oh. afterwards, we got talking and we decided to work together on something. Hmm. So, so in a way, it was more, much more radical than, than the violin pieces. Mm -hmm. Because, well, it just, it was. But they were radical enough too. <laughs> on a scale of 1 to 10 of radical... Uh, radicalness. <laughs> the violin concertos were maybe three, would you say? And uh, this with Lucy. Wanda. I would say um, seven and ten. Seven and ten. <laughs> yeah. So I thought it fascinating that you performed with her on stage. What mm. exactly were you manipulating, if you were? Well, it's, a, it's I suppose really the thing I was manipulating was starting and stopping and the loudness. Um, at ZKM, it was a bit more because it was for, it was for eight tracks. Ah. So, so the vinyl, of course, was only two tracks. So often we only performed it on two, but sometimes on four, usually on four tracks. And that always required setting up and <clears throat> and liaising with the sound engineers and things. Mm. So I was a necessary part there. But although we had lots of plans for me to do more on stage, I all I really did was to to adjust the levels very carefully as we went along. So from what I understand you had uh the what I call the backbone of the piece, uh sent out through seven speakers. This is what I found online. Is this true? So if you had seven or eight, was it seven speakers, eight speakers? Well, it was, there's an eight track version, there's a six track version and so oh. on. It depended, it depended entirely on the, on the studio. The most elaborate one was at ZKM and Cologne. Right, I see. Um, which has a, 
the good facilities for doing it. How um, are the how are the concerts received? Do you remember? Very well, very well. Um, well, I think so. I mean, lots of yes, and um, lots of interested people, and and always full, so. Nobody booed. <laughs> anyway, listen. It's been lovely talking to you, but you know, I have to. I have to um, sign off now. Yes, uh, I noticed thank the you very time. Much for talking. I'm sorry for keeping you up this late. I just noticed the time. Uh, I don't see any more questions coming this way, and it's way past your bedtime. But I want right, to. Th so I wanted. I just have one last question for you before I sign off as well. Dreamer or visionary? How would you describe the way your mind works? Would you call yourself a dreamer or visionary? What is the difference? Well, according to the dictionary I found online, a visionary has a strong vision of the future, whether accurate. Or whether it fails miser miserab um, miserably, <laughs> a dreamer has ideas or conceives projects regarded as impractical. I think regarded as impractical to the general public, but who knows until you try it out, right? Yeah, um, I don't. I I think that the projects I do are as difficult as they possibly could be. And require a lot of invention, and that's what's exciting. Mm. So, dreaming, I think, really. Yeah, <laughs> I think I call you a very uh, expert dreamer. <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, it's been very nice to talk to you and everyone, and lots of luck with your future. Thanks, Peter. Right. You. They will be in touch. Thanks, Peter. You've been great. Mm. I'll send you those pictures that you wanted. Uh, yes. And I'll wait for yours of you and Leon. So everyone's yeah. saying good night to you and thanks, Peter, for your time. Um, so take care, and I'll catch up with you Thank via you. email. Thanks, Peter. Very good. Bye. -bye. Bye. So everyone, uh, that was Peter Zinoviev. It was very distracting for him because the video on his Skype was uh, very pixely. I did see it at one point in time and I had to try and ignore it. But uh, so, you know, he looked very, uh, as I said, uh, he, he had a very far away uh, gaze and uh, it was also getting late. I think it's, it's almost 12 midnight. So, um, I wanted to thank you all for being here. I was expecting a larger group and more questions. So I had to throw in my fill-ins. Uh, but I really hope that some of you would have thrown in those questions, as I said. So um, for synth history fans, since there's some of you here, I have more trouble for you on the 19th of December. Double the trouble with Team Minimoog. I have James Scott, project leader, and Herb Deutsch, co-inventor, uh, who will grace us with their presence. Please put that date in your calendar of events, and it will be uh, broadcast during my regular time of 7 p.m. Central, which for uh, you Australians will be 12 noon. I'm not sure about UK. Jess, what time would it be in the UK? I guess it'll be more like 1 or 2 a.m. in the morning, something like that. But uh, my Aussie mates, I hope you can join me with your questions for the Moak team. Um... And, but for next Saturday, though, if you're a performing musician and curious about how to jump on the virtual Second Life bandwagon, join me and my good friend Tony Gerber next week at uh, the regular time as well. Uh, before I bid you adieu uh, to buy my four CD and poster set, uh, you can find the URL in the text below or you can scan uh, this QR code. Um, I'll make your special autograph uh, dedication on the poster. Um, yes, Jess. Uh, Jess is telling me that in the UK where he is, it's quarter to midnight. 
Um, I want to say thanks to all of you. Thanks, Tony. Thanks, Jim. Um, and the rest of you. And uh, please join me next week, as I mentioned, or the week after. Uh, I do appreciate a large crowd because it helps keep the vibe and keep the pace of the show moving. So thank you all. Uh, take care. Stay safe. If you, it's your morning, have a great day. If it's your night, sleep tight. Uh, and I'll see you next week, if not the week after that. Uh, to my Aussie friends, it's been great seeing you. Uh, and to my US and UK friends, likewise. So take care now. Bye.